Hi everyone. Thanks for joining the session today. My name is Harsh Shavla and I work as Data and AI Specialist on Azure in Microsoft team in India. In this session, we'll talk about how as a DBA or a data professional, you can embrace the field of data engineering. Today, every company wants to build data-driven culture, which essentially means that they want to have highly efficient analytic systems, which can provide relevant inputs to the CXOs for their for building product strategies or any marketing plan or any growth plan for the company. And in this session, we'll talk about how as a data engineer, you can play a very critical role in this journey. A little bit about me. I've spent 15 years uh, uh, you know, working on data platform solutions. And for last 12 years, I've been part of Microsoft where I've done various roles on data platform technologies. And I had a privilege to set up a community for SQL Server in uh, Delhi NCR, northern, northern part of India, especially on data platform technologies. And recently I have written two books. Uh, my recent book was Data Lake Analytics on Azure, which got published last month. And last year I wrote about, you know, building microservices on Microsoft Azure. Now, uh, agenda for this session is uh, why data is growing. I mean, what is the need of data engineer, right? And then what is data lake analytics? And uh, as, a, as a data engineer, what, what role you play in the ecosystem? And then we'll talk about why you should invest time on Microsoft Azure to build uh, your uh, you know, career on data engineering. Then last, we'll talk about uh, uh, guidance to be a data engineer. Now, if you see why data is growing, right? So definitely there are multiple reasons to it. I, I have just outlined uh, some of the reasons which I feel played a very critical role. One is of course arrival of NoSQL DBs. Uh, if we talk about uh, you know, maybe 10 to 15 years back, we generally used to talk about only structured data where uh, relational data stores like SQL Server, Oracle, Sybase, they were really prominent in the industry. But slowly, uh, I think after 2010, this industry picked up really well, and there was advent of NoSQL DBs, and uh, that's that's actually gave that gave a lot of flexibility to developer to use these DBs to build schema-free, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem, right? Then, of course, there was advent of public cloud uh, that also changed. That was a major paradigm shift, I would say and people, uh, companies had a lot of flexibility to innovate faster and build their solution, build prototypes quickly and then scrap it off if it doesn't work because uh, initial investment was very, very low, right? And then uh, we had a shift off from the developer community instead of building like monolithic applications, which is which means that you will have just one technology for front end and then one for DB, right? And then, the application, entire application is built. But with microservices, uh, developers had choices to make, for example, if, if they have structured data, of course, they can use SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, Postgre. But if the data is semi-structured, they, they could use MongoDB, Cosmos DB, or any, any other DB in NoSQL uh, ecosystem. Right, and then of course there was advancement of industries also. Uh, if you talk about industries like manufacturing, agriculture, uh, they also evolved a lot. BFSI for that matter, right? So there was a lot of advancement in the industries as well. So let's go a little deeper in each of these points and then understand, uh, you know, the narrative behind it. So when we talk about arrival of NoSQL DB, so there are four types of uh, NoSQL DBs. One is document store. Then we have key value store. Column family and graph DB, <clears throat> right? So document store. If we talk about IoT data, so they produce a lot of JSON data. If we talk about Twitter streams, right? So a lot of JSON data coming out of it, and to process this data, right? Uh, the, these document store uh, is very handy. If you talk about MongoDB or Cosmos DB, right? You can store this uh, document data really well, they really efficiently. Then key value store again, uh, you know, as a if if it is a e-commerce website and uh, for a user, if there are multiple items in the cart, right? For one user, there are maybe 10, 20 items in a cart. This is a very classic use case for key value pair. Or even as a gaming company, you want to store user profile. Uh, you know, <clears throat> this is this is a classic use case for key value pair DBs. Then column family store. 
uh, you know, uh, generally for analytic system, this is very handy because, uh, you know, generally uh, if the if a table has maybe 100 columns and for reporting purpose, you, you perform a lot of uh, aggregations where you just pick a couple of columns rather than entire 100 columns. That's where you save a lot of memory, compute and IO, right? And these these column stores are really handy in such scenarios. Then GraphDB. Uh, you know, if you want to build uh, hierarchies in the deep data or relationship within the data, these graph DBs are really handy. And very uh, good example here is uh, if you see recommended friends on Facebook or on LinkedIn, recommended connections. This is one of the classic use case for graph DBs. <clears throat> then monolithic to microservice application. So there is a concept called polyglot applications and polyglot persistence which means in one application you can use multiple types of databases and in the list if you see for transaction data you can have rdbms for click stream and logs data you can use blob storage for session state product catalog and building search in the website or your application you can use nosql db so for one application now you have multiple types of databases which means i i can generate more and more data right then if you see advent of public cloud so with cloud right we started innovating faster because i can set up the environment within like couple of minutes or couple of hours rather than spending time on first uh, getting the hardware then installing the software then configuring the software it is like it takes a lot of initial time but with cloud it reduced a lot of efforts there and that's why you know uh, you know it, it gives a lot of uh, you know flexibility to the end user and if you see specifically pass offering right so generally when you talk about cloud we have three different uh, variations one is infrastructure as a service then platform as a service then software as a service right so uh, you know in, in platform as a service generally you know i, I don't i don't want to get into details uh, for for these three all three uh, uh, you know variations i'll just go very specific to pass uh, just to stick to the context so as a DBA, right? So I used to manage a lot of uh, work uh, operations, right? I, I had to take backups, I had to monitor, uh, and I had to do patching upgrades, right? So a lot of stuff I had to do as a DBA. And I've seen many, many companies, you know, DBAs are just busy doing a lot of operational work. And the real work they want to do is performance tuning and optimization. And for that, very little time is left because of all these operations. And with cloud, when we, uh, when we talk about cloud, right? There, uh, you know, a lot of things are uh, just managed by the public cloud platform. And if I give an example of SQL managed instance on Azure, right? It's a pass offering where we give you inbuilt uh, high availability. Then you have auto scalability, uh, then automated backups are done, and then upgrades, patching is taken care by Microsoft, monitoring, a lot of monitoring is automatically uh, you know, enabled for you so that whenever there is a problem, you can just consume the data and understand the cause of the issue. Then again, uh, ease to manage security. A lot of features are just uh, turnkey turn key features where just click of a button, the uh, and DDoS protection is enabled for you, right? So it's, it's like very, very easy to manage. Now, uh, as a DBA, right? So now you have a lot of room to innovate, a lot of room to learn new things as well, right? Plus, as a business, right? I really don't need to worry about capital expense. I don't need to do upfront investment. I can just do pay as you go. Uh, I now... Uh, you know that's the reason why I, do, I really don't need to wait for longer a longer time to just get the approval from the management i can just quickly start and build on it if it works out i can continue otherwise i can simply discard it off right so that is advantage now advancement of industries of course if you see manufacturing today uh, you know we talk about intelligent factories right where they are using a lot of iot data to monitor they want to do proprietary maintenance to know when this machinery should be uh, sent for service, right? So a lot of things they want to uh, do based on the technologies. Then again, uh, they have a lot of sensor data coming in, video streams to see, uh, you know, whether uh, the uh, employees or workers are following the SOPs, right? Are they wearing helmet or the jacket? Uh, so all these things they want to capture remotely. We'll, we'll, I'll show you this in a demo as well and we'll see how it works then e-commerce right e-commerce also if you see a lot of hyper personalization is being done a lot of marketing campaigns they are uh, 
or you know they're routed to the personas right rather than all the users so they have targeted user for each type of marketing campaign i mean it's, it's it has become more efficient and more user friendly to so end of the day they want to gain more wallet share and of course stickiness of the platform right and that's why they consume a lot of uh, uh, they, they kind of capture a lot of click stream data as well so that they can give you better experience similarly in gaming also uh, you know a lot of uh, scalability is needed if an application is launched suddenly there may be millions of downloads right and then of course uh, they want to roll out features really fast and these are these are the advancements which are generating a lot of data even agriculture for that matter they want to do precision farming uh, so they use satellite uh, imaging to understand which part of the field needs uh, uh, what amount of water right so i mean they want to do precisely uh, you know everything on the farm so that they produce the uh, right outcome as well as they don't waste resources so that is why you know all these industries you know if you see they are they are they are uh, you know uh, evolving every day and if, if you see all everything uh, put together one thing is common is they are generating a lot of data today we have millions of you know sensors out there we talk about connected bike where you know we sending we we send telemetry data to the end server and we do analysis based on the efficiency of the engine right so i mean it's it's very common now and that's why companies want to build data driven culture they want to capture uh, each and every data even a uh, data which is uh, filled by by a customer on a physical form they want to analyze the data as well they want to bring the data in the system and if you see a decade back it was it was not really possible because uh, i was totally relying on the structured data and managing unstructured semi structured data i i couldn't actually think about bringing that in the system right so today because i have that flexibility now i can think okay i can bring the physical form data also in the system i can just scan the data using ocr and make that in a json format and bring that for analysis right and and the uh, the opportunity is immense and if you see as a data engineer you really need to know what kind of data exists today and how we can bring that in the ecosystem so now i just i uh, want to do touch upon industry point here in in my career of 15 years i have seen this point is really critical to understand as a as a tech tech uh, professional right so if you are working in technology you generally think about how to learn a new skill in tech but this is also very important you need to know which which industry you work in for example if i am i am in manufacturing industry the use cases for manufacturing is are totally different if i am working in bfsi bfsi has a lot of compliance and that's why they are a little slower to move to a uh, to public cloud though they are becoming cloud friendly now but of course i mean so this is this is a reason why industry uh, knowing industry is also essential right so i can definitely understand the road map i can find out what are the use cases what kind of data is relevant and then you know plan my uh, you know career accordingly right so it it will give you different perspective rather than thinking technical you can have maybe industry view to understand what you really should do to improve your uh, you know skills right that will give you a lot of uh, understanding and perspective so before we go forward i'll just give you a feel uh, you know with the help of a demo and let's see how a gen how a platform generally looks like so this is this is about wide world importers this is a company which manufactures a lot of uh, you know uh, you know this merchandise they do b2b and b2c they have their uh, you know website where they sell a lot of uh, stuff to the end consumer and also to the different businesses so if you see here we we talking about brake system here right so they have different brake systems and they have different uh, merchandise as well uh, if i see so these are my you know uh, sunglasses and t-shirts and caps all these things they sell now if as a executive i want to know what is happening right uh, in terms of sales as well as in in terms of manufacturing uh, right so this is a dashboard that has been created on the left hand side if you see we we see the data of what happened in the past and in the on this in the middle we see what is happening right now and then on the right side we'll see what can happen in future so if i go a little deeper here Uh, and in campaign and sales analytics we see what is revenue versus target if the revenue is 2.2 billion dollars 
what is my current uh, if my target is 2.2 billion dollar what is the re uh, revenue today so it is like 1.85 billion dollars similarly what is cost to good goods sold then what is the profit that i made and these are graphs for you know to understand a little bit in more detail in real time uh, uh, data the section we see how many sensors are active today and what is the machine status uh, how many alarms and incidents have been raised and this is another uh, mttr mtbf you know hours uh, you know for uh, manufacturing you know this is a kpi and then on the right hand side if you see real time sentiment analytics like what is uh, you know sentiment uh, uh, based on the tweet tweets right so this is my 254 tweets i have seen uh, and then uh, you know based on that tweet count and the sentiment analytics also we can see then on the right hand side if you see we have predictive maintenance and safety analytics it shows what are the areas where you may need some uh, you know maintenance in in, in near future then also what is the anomaly uh, uh, you know based on telemetry data collected from iot and then again incident risk by factory location so these are this is a dashboard which is created for executive and each report can can uh, be drilled through and uh, we can gain more more understanding so if you see this is this is another uh, dashboard uh, which will give you a lot of details on campaign analytics right so what is my campaign roi this is 4.8 million dollars this is this is this can be a campaign on email on phone so that's where your hyper personalization uh, comes in picture to understand what uh, what is your preference so do you check your email often or you check your text messages or whatsapp so they uh, you know all these things can be captured really well and you know these are uh, on the right side if you see operational analytics where you see what are the critical alerts and then what is the temperature vibration so these are all machinery information that that has been captured okay now uh, we'll go a little deeper into this architecture a little later okay and now uh, just one more thing i would like to show you is uh, this is incident risk by factory location if i click on this video i can as an executive i can see what is happening in my factory why there is a there is alarm which is raised for this uh, you know uh, safety okay uh, if i click here okay it's taking some time just give it a second sorry it's just yeah the internet connectivity is a little slow just one second so if you see here right now it shows non -com non compliant and all these workers they are wearing helmet and and the worker in the back background you know he's not wearing helmet and videos streams uh, analytics can capture that and it is raising non compliant alarm and this is uh, where you know uh, you know companies uh, maybe executive suites or maybe people who are in leadership they can reach the uh, you know the supervisor directly and they can raise an alert that okay people are not following the sops please uh, you know uh, follow that so that that's how generally uh, this can be done other thing i would like to show is uh, this if you see uh, you know this is factory overflow uh, overview where it shows you uh, what is happening on the floor this is uh, a heat map and if i show you factory alerts so this is this is my factory uh, view and if i want to see what is happening in my factory if everything is working normal if you see here we have red alert let's see what it is what what it is and see there are alerts of product defect rate spike pp compliance alert and production quality degradation and this is my live feed that i can see uh, from the plant right so if you see as a as a executive or a, a leadership uh, you know uh, individual right you see a lot of data you can drill drill down to a level where you can see what is actually happening in the factory right now 
uh, I can see live feeds, I can see the alerts, I can I can actually involve my teams based on this data, right? So this give you one stop shop of uh, entire things, entire uh, view of the organization itself. And uh, one another demo I would like to show you is uh, just one second. Yeah, so this is another demo. If you see, this is solar solar power generation plant. Uh, so basically, you know, Schneider Electric, they have set up solar plants uh, to generate power and pr provide it to the schools and uh, medical institutes and hospitals in Nigeria. So if you see, if you see here uh, in this plan, in this uh, dashboard, we can see uh, what are the places where my solar uh, energy, solar power is being provided. And I can also see how much solar energy is generated depending and what is the demand right now. Will I be able to meet the demand in near future or there is some, you know, I need to do something. If there is something, some alerts I need to manage. So if you see here, we have uh, alert. Let's click click on this alert and see this is the factory view that I get. It's not a factory view. It's, it's more like a, you know, a healthcare center view. It shows you uh, how many solar panels are set up, how many batteries are, uh, you know, uh, what is the what is the condition of a battery, uh, right? So if you see, we have a temperature warning, and here we have efficiency warning. We can actually click on alert details, and uh, kind of go there. Uh, if I click on uh, just one second uh, on the alert details, here here is uh, what I see. I can see excessive battery temperature, solar generation restricted. If you see solar uh, 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 irradiance right and actual charge so there is a lot of difference there which means that uh, I'm my, uh, my either my batteries are malfunctioning or there is some problem with the setup okay so here uh, uh, that this is one parameter and then also battery operating temperature so battery temperature is also rising maybe i need some maintenance there and if i click on create site notification and this notification can be sent to the uh, supervisor uh, you know working there so this is this is a beauty of uh, IoT data, and uh, a lot of data which is uh, picked up in a batch batch mode, and can we can build this kind of dashboard, right? So this is where data engineer plays a key role, as a as an individual because you need to know what kind of data is available, and how you can bring this data for analytics and give it to data scientists to build predictions for you, right? Now. Uh, definitely uh, understand as we, as we discussed right what is the role of data engineer you need to understand different types of data you need to know how to create ingestion pipelines then how to transform the data then architecting the modern data warehouse solutions and provide raw data to data scientists so this is this is typically what a data engineer should do there may be more but this is my understanding bare minimum uh, data engineer should understand then uh, classic concept of data lake analytics so today uh, you would have heard uh, you know people talking a lot about data lake analytics earlier it was enterprise data warehouse or uh, you know maybe hadoop ecosystem but suddenly there is a change people now talk about building data lake uh, you know for analytics now let's let's understand what what is data lake analytics and what has changed for last uh, you know last 15 years how it has this industry has transformed so when we generally talk about enterprise data warehouse, I still remember uh, when I started my career. Uh, so I used to work in Oracle and uh, there was a need to build analytic system where, you know, uh, a lot of data had to be brought in and then uh, analytical layer has to be put in where we use this data, build cubes and dimension and use crystal report for the you know, analysis purpose. So uh, enterprise data warehouse generally looks like this where uh, on the left hand side if i see i have data sources this is different operational data systems and a little bit of fat, uh, flat files and i have this is my staging area which is essentially uh, a sql server or oracle database where i can do a lot of transformation and then once the transformation is done i i send this data to the ods layer this is my ods layer and uh, then the data is further used for building data marts and then for analysis and data mining. This is how a data warehouse used to look like. Now, uh, you know, 
with with trend when the data started increasing right from gbs to terabytes to terabytes to dozens of terabytes multi uh, you know uh, tens of hundreds of terabytes right then uh, you know there was a concept called messy parallel processing which came in limelight so uh, there was a lot of innovation in hardware industry also right where they talked about parallel computing which means rather than just one system uh, working to solve my problem i can have multiple systems working together to you know make my uh, just solve my problem so uh, which means that you know uh, i have let's say one terabyte of data and i i partition the data across multiple nodes and when i run the query all these nodes work together and make my query run faster and with the help of this mpp architecture the queries which were taking maybe hours or days to run they were able to finish in minutes and seconds that is the power of mpp and sql dw uh, uh, you know or synapse analytics sql pools which we call it now they they are it is based on sql uh, this um, uh, massively parallel processing architecture even there are uh, companies in in amazon redshift is the, that example snowflake is another example for mpp uh, architecture analytic system then uh, we have distributed processing of course uh, hadoop ecosystem uh, so if we are talking about structured data uh, if the data is uh, of the source systems are mostly structured like sql server oracle the preference is to use mpp because mpp is also the it works in the similar fashion you can write similar queries there is a very small s curve uh, to build this system and uh, you know kind of uh, uh, you know write your queries so it is like similar experience but if your system is, uh, uh, is your data sources are mostly uh, you know uh, semi structured or unstructured data the preference is to use hadoop ecosystem right in hadoop generally we see the concept is similar where we have name node and data nodes to and uh, the, and we have map reduce queries to run and execute the task and return the result so some way somewhere here also you know you see distributed uh, in a lot of different compute nodes are working together to solve the problem it is a different concept and uh, uh, you know this is this solves a similar problem but for structured and semi structured data uh, semi structured and unstructured data so, now moving forward right uh, we have seen the transformation from edw then mpp then distributed but today uh, people talk about modern data. idea is to make both mpp and distributed processing engines uh, work together and build single source of truth if i go deeper into mdw we have the sample architecture uh, where we have uh, uh, data sources on the left hand side and then there are two layers one is batch processing layer and then second is my real time stream processing layer and generally these two layers are called cold path and hot path and then once the data is processed then it lands into analytical data store and then it is consumed for analytics and reporting purposes okay and i'll just give you one real life uh, uh, you know architecture if you see here uh, yeah so this is this is the demo architecture uh, you know we have uh, iot telemetry data and the, at the lower part if you see we have cnc and mes data hvac pumps and twitter data which is like real time data going to my iot hub and from there it is going to azure cosmos db and from cosmos db it is landing into my synapse analytic for analytics purposes on top if we see we have uh, oracle mes and teradata sap hana data uh, going to synapse analytics through my azure data factory or uh, data pipelines that we can build in azure synapse analytics workspace and from there it is going to power bi this is something similar we are talking about here hot layer and cold layer let's go a little deeper uh, into both of these layers if you see this is this is a architecture pattern for modern data warehouse and uh, advanced data analytics put together so if you see in in uh, this data sources right uh, we have sensors sensors and iot data and then we have an ingestion layer uh, for iot hub and apache kafka from there you know uh, this is being processed and it is landing into my model and serve zone either for power bi or for real time applications 
right so if i go a little uh, further right in ingest i have these are the technologies and services that are available uh, that we can use under ingest phase for example if my data is coming from uh, through an iot sensor right i can use iot hub or apache kafka event hub to hold the data so basically when we talk about real time data because the speed of data is really high velocity is really high so we need some sort of caching in the middle uh, so that we don't lose the data right so uh, event hub iot hub apache kafka there are many more like rabbitmq is another example which we generally use to hold the data so that it can be processed successfully okay and then uh, for uh, for my uh, this cold tier right for the data which which is not real time and it needs periodic analytics that is that goes uh, you know through azure data factory where we do extraction and transformation right and the data is loaded into uh, my data lake okay so that is what happens uh, for ingest phase for both hot and cold tier so if we talk about hot tier in in this uh, diagram this is my hot tier and the lower part is my cold tier okay then if i go forward right this is storage now uh, here we will talk about what is etl and elt and in edw example right uh, we used to do a lot of transformation and then we used to load the data into uh, my ods layer or my staging area but with the advent of cloud what we, we do is we do elt we do extraction using azure data factory and then we do loading into data lake and then we do transformation using data bricks and then you know it goes further so the plan, why we do elt now because today on azure or any cloud platform we do pay as you go we we kind of uh, buy services through pay as you go and we just pay for the services uh, you know which we use and for the duration right so for example if i use a service for one hour i'll just pay for one hour and uh, when we talk about elt right so when the data is loaded into data lake storage so the jobs can periodically kick in where i will uh, spin up my compute to process this data and then uh, and i'll switch it, switch that off so that i don't need to pay for it so instead of running this in the resource throughout the day we'll just pay for uh, till the time the job is run so you save a lot of money there and that's why elt makes more sense because you have that flexibility today and in prep and train uh, if it is a modern data warehouse scenario we really don't talk about any uh, machine learning this this portion is not available for mdw mdw is specifically uh, for descriptive analytics right where uh, what i do is i pick up data from uh, data lake and then i use either spark or i can even use synapse analytics where we have both uh, uh, you know spark and sql uh, data warehouse and to process the data and i can use that for uh, you know uh, from analytical layer and from there it can go to power bi right and then uh, in model and serve depending on the uh, scenario uh, i can simply use power bi to to kind of serve the data or if there are there is a requirement of real time apps i may also use cosmos db and from there i can send the data to real time apps if if i want to send notifications right real time alerts or if i am doing real time location tracking so all these services are really handy now if we uh, quickly jump into a demo right i'll just uh, give you a little perspective here and as we discussed uh, in uh, previously uh, this is my uh, you know iot data and uh, which go, goes through iot hub and cosmos db and then i have uh, you know my manufacturing data which which goes through data factory into uh, uh, my synapse analytics right now this is the this is a portal view where uh, iot hub is configured and from iot hub the data is landing into cosmos db as we as we seen in this uh, previous uh, uh, you know uh, diagram Uh, my real time data is going into cosmos db right so let's see how cosmos db looks like this is my iot hub and from there i go to cosmos db and if i click on the database i see these containers manufacturing quality is a, is a container where i have quality data right if i click on this items i can see machine wise quality data 
right? And uh, now if I want to enable analytics layer, right? So one way is of course, whatever data I have, I can use ETL tools to process the data and make sure uh, it is available for analytics. However, in Cosmos DB, we already have an option called analytical store. If you see this, this is my analytical store. As soon as you click on, it definitely uh, kicks in the jobs internally to send this data, uh, make it available for analytics. And we will see uh, going forward uh, in this demo how we can consume that analytical store in Synapse Analytics. So if you see, uh, it's already been added for this. Yeah, the option is on. And now let's quickly see how Synapse Analytics workspace looks like. And this is the Snaps Analytic workspace where on the left hand side I have the option to orchestrate, check the data, then you know process it, and then uh, if this is this is the interface that we generally look at. Now if I click on the workspace and if I try to add new data source, I need to click on connect to an external data. This is a step that I need to follow. Once I click on the external data, I will click on uh, Azure Cosmos DB SQL API and click continue. And then I'll add subscription details, my Cosmos DB account name, then database name. And since it is already set up for me, I'll just click cancel and discard the changes. Right? Let's go into Cosmos DB since it is already added. And we'll talking, we were talking about manufacturing quality. If I create a new notebook and load the data to data frame, this is automatically generated for me. Since uh, I have I've already created this query, I'll just execute. And this is how this data looks like. And if you see the job exec execution, it is running Scala jobs in the backend, right? And uh, uh, there is something called as HTP, Hybrid Transaction Analytical Processing, because today uh, companies want uh, real life, uh, real real time data analysis. Uh, they don't want to ha have any sort of delay, right? So that's why you know this this feature comes really handy. And uh, if you see all the scripts have been pre-written for transformation and everything. And uh, uh, when, you, when you run this data, you can absolutely see uh, you know, how this looks like. But there are systems where you need traditional reporting and you need queries sort of uh, in SQL queries where which, which, you, can general, which you can use. Uh, so if you see, this is one SQL query and on this uh, uh, connect to a SQL on demand. So we are talking about uh, you know, uh, serverless SQL pay-as-you-go uh, on-demand service, uh, which is non-provisioned uh, service, and you can just run your query, uh, and it's more like a query as a service, right? So you just run the query, it will uh, spin up the compute in the backend, as soon as the query is finished, the compute is off. And this is how you execute it, right? And also you can create a view which you can consume later in Power BI, right? And uh, this is, and you create multiple joints uh, depending on the need. And this is how it looks like. Now, if I want to create Power BI report uh, using this view, let's see how it looks like. So there is already a product quality report. If I click plus and I can uh, select the fields, uh, you know, whatever fields I need, and then I can put a graph and I am done. Now, generally how Azure Synapse uh, link works, right? So as soon as you enable, uh, you know, analytical store option uh, to on, it will it will create auto sync to analytical store, which will be a column store data, uh, uh, you know, for analytical queries. And then Snap link is integrated with Synapse Analytics, which can be used as we have seen already. Uh, and we can put machine learning, big data, or any, any uh, Spark or SQL query. So this is the beauty here. If you see, in Synapse Analytics, both uh, Spark queries as well as SQL queries are, are possible to be run on the single data source. So analytical store, uh, both these uh, uh, compute engines can, can use that to process your queries to solve the problem, right? And this is, this is what we were talking about in Modern Data Warehouse. And if you want to, if now we were, uh, if we talk about uh, batch mode processing, you really need to orchestrate. If you see, these are the data pipelines which you can uh, create. In this case, uh, if you see the first one is SAP HANA to ADLS. Whatever data we have in SAP HANA, we are trying to put it into ADLS. So this is my copy data task and mapping data flow. And this is as simple as that. And uh, 
if i expand that i can see what is what is there uh, what is happening inside the uh, data pipeline this is my marketing db migrations and then sales db migration then we talk about time series db migration uh, you know all these uh, pipelines have been created already and if i want to monitor these pipelines i have this monitoring option in built into the platform and uh, uh, you know i can see what is the status and if you see it is really simple to manage this is a one one in, uh, interface where you are managing your spark uh, you know queries you you can write spark queries on the data you can write sql queries on the data right uh, you have option to use provision provision compute uh, or you can do on demand compute it's very very simple and uh, easy to manage and of course uh, there is a seamless integration with the components other components like power bi it is so easy it is integrated with the platform you can do machine learning uh, on, on the same data in the single platform and uh, if you see the support of databases directly landing uh, data into synapse that is a beautiful feature because cosmos db is there then multiple other dbs uh, you know can also be integrated in similar way let's see when when that option becomes available but definitely that will be really handy and and the advantage is advantage is you really don't need to run any etl tool to bring this data into data lake it is already available with just a click of a button now if we see data right uh, this is manufacturing iot data and we have uh, uh, support of parquet file uh, parquet file format and if i if i want to run top 100 queries i am actually using sql on demand and i can just simply open that query and see the chat right and if i go to workspace i can also develop uh, the queries uh, you know in the database and i connect to the db and just run simple queries there itself right and if you see the uh, the records that we're talking about you know they are like the 35 billion records here we are talking about and this huge number of record and the speed is uh, is really really good and uh, of course uh, you can run complex queries on billions of records of table in within flick of seconds okay and then also if you want you can write spark uh, you know queries and like we are writing python queries here on the data that also is possible if you want to do predictive analytics okay so this is this is the demo that i wanted to show you to give you a feel of uh, how synapse analytics looks like and how this modern data warehouse is uh, can be seen in action right so now we'll go back we'll go back and see understand uh, why you should invest time on microsoft azure right so if you see uh, of course that we saw uh, we have unified experience uh, it's so easy to uh, work on synapse analytics uh, moreover if you have already done some investment on databricks you can of course use that right uh, there is no problem if you have done azure data factory already you can do that and any new development you can put it on synapse uh, but a lot of innovation in this space for uh, to look for and uh, you know uh, it is real modern data warehouse application in action now uh, uh, if you see operational data warehouse uh, database management system uh, this is a magic a magic quadrant created by gartner and these are the consulting firms which really are helpful and as a cio if i want to know whether i should invest uh, in this uh, in this uh, platform or uh, what is a road map right so you really need to know whether you, the platform where you are spending so much of money and effort uh, what how is the road map uh, look like uh, will this environment sustain for longer time or you know so a lot of factors as a cio you need to look at uh, so here if you see database management system microsoft tops the chart uh, you know we are in leader quadrant and of course uh, on the top as you can see here i will use this laser pointers if you see this is microsoft on the top uh, and we have very strong position there then if we talk about analytics uh, database management solution for analytics uh, we are again in leaders quadrant so as a oem uh, of a technology or a service you definitely want to be in the leaders quadrant and on the top uh, you know uh, you know ahead of the curve for sure and this is where we are microsoft then if we talk about business intelligence we are again on the top where you know power bi is a platform which is uh, which is being adopted uh, by the industry really well and uh, we have seen various scenario where you know customers has done a lot of investment on different cloud vendors but they want to use power bi 
and that's why they use Microsoft Azure for that. And then uh, if we see machine learning platform, we are in visionary quadrant. We want to be leaders, but again, the advantage is we are, uh, we have a great partnership with Databricks and SAS. And in case uh, you want to build data, uh, machine learning and data science uh, uh, solution, you can definitely use Databricks and SAS on Azure. Okay. Now, uh, uh, I think we come to the end of this presentation. Uh, let's talk about how you can become data engineer. For sure, I think you need to know what are the different sources, data sources available, and uh, be very sure on, uh, you know, uh, just check what industry you are working with and understand uh, what is the digital transformation path that industry is taking, what are the use cases, so that you really understand, you know, where you have to spend time, what is the roadmap for your success. And uh, this is really, really important feature. I, I just, I just wanted to emphasize on this very specifically. Then learn about technologies in each phase, in, in the four phases, right? We talked about in just phase where for uh, real time data, you need IoT hub, event hub, uh, maybe, you know, uh, Apache Kafka you can use. And if you are doing batch mode analysis, you need uh, uh, Azure Data Factory. And if you're using Synapse, you have data pipelines that you can build. Right again in storage phase, you talk about Azure Data Lake storage, and then in prep and train, you have data breaks. You can use Synapse, uh, Spark pools as well. And then if you do model and serve, uh, if you talk about model and serve, of course you need. Uh, I'll just quickly since it is important. Yeah. So if you if you talk about model and serve, you talk about uh, uh, real time maps uh, where which is which is more of a consumption of the data that, um, that you have built it can be power bi it can be some app it can be further the model that you're building these models can be consumed in the ingest layer also uh, uh, sorry in the in this uh, streaming layer also <clears throat> spark streaming or there is something uh, called as uh, uh, stream analytics of azure which is native azure service uh, there you can call these models if it is a, a fraud transaction or it is like if you're applying, if a person is applying for a loan and as a company you want to know whether this person will be able to pay the loan or not. So the, these are the uh, these are the predictive models that can be called in real time to prevent, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe frauds or, you know, uh, adding extra checks of validation before we give the loan to a person, right? So this, this, is, the, this is really important. And uh, again, you can go for certifications, uh, go for DP200, 201. It's a, it's a certification built for data engineers. And of course, you can read my book. Uh, the, in the book that I, I've really delved deeper into all these concepts, all these phases. And there are some practical examples that you can try. Uh, and uh, you know, definitely pursue this as a career. Thank you so much for your time and uh, I will open it for Q&A and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.